My name's Adrian Wolfe. It's lovely to be here. Um, I've become familiar with this charity over the last few months, and I hear it's been going for a few years, and it's, it's very much on the upward curve. Um, I'm a children's kidney doctor uh, working in the um, Royal Manchester Children's Hospital, but the uh, other half of my time I work in Manchester University. And my interest has always been in trying to find out why people are sometimes born without any kidneys or with poorly formed kidneys. And that's the kind of general theme of <clears throat> what I'll tell you about today. Um, I've been very involved with one charity over the years, which is Kidney Research UK, which is the biggest funder in kidney research in, in our country. With a, I think they fund about £7 million pounds of research a year. Uh, I, I have been a trustee with them, uh, but I stepped down after my term last year, so it's lovely to be to learn about new charities such as your own. So um, I, I, I know we can't be really interactive in this big hall, but do you, do you know how many people there are in the UK who would be dead if they weren't on regular dialysis or hadn't received a kidney transplant. Do you know? You have to shout, I'm a bit deaf. No. You don't know. <laughs> Do you think it's a thousand people? Ten, 10,000 people? 50,000? So in, in the UK at the moment, there's 65,000 people with such severe kidney disease that they, they have to be kept alive by dialysis or being, having a kidney transplant. And although those treatments are really wonderful, in fact, even in the UK, there's, there's a waiting list to, be on a, uh, to get a transplant. Um, and when you're on dialysis, actually it's what, not well known, but your life expectancy, if you're on regular dialysis, is less than for many cancer patients. Um, and it's not a great life being on dialysis. But in the UK, we're really lucky. Um, it, it, the, the, the situation is even bigger globally, of course. There are about two million people worldwide who are, who's li who are alive because they have dialysis or a kidney transplant. But much worse than that, because in most countries around the world, you can't get those treatments people have worked out that two or three million people around the world die every year because they can't get these treatments. So what the reason I'm banging on about that is that, you know, we need to learn more about what causes these diseases and to think about new treatments. And, you know, what does cause severe kidney, kid, kidney disease? Well, nearly all of the patients have got a rare disease the one exception is if you have sugar diabetes, um, that can cause kidney failure. But if you remove diabetes, the other 70% of people all have a rare disease. So it's very much in, in the remit of this charity. So I, um, over the last 10 years, I've run something called a kidney genetic clinic first of all when I was at Great Ormond Street in London and more recently in Manchester. And the, the, the idea of this is we see families where kidney disease runs in the family, we try and make a genetic diagnosis, hand in hand with the genetic team in Manchester, and then we can give them a reason why their baby maybe was born with very severe kidney disease, and we can give them counselling, which is all, you know, great. But as, as I've become older, I've started to, I was starting to think about, you know, is that enough? Should we not be thinking about, you know, why are these diseases occurring? And can we think of new treatments for these diseases? And this is where the, the topic I want to tell you about for the next 20 minutes comes in, which is the, I've called it the promise of stem cell technology um, to understand rare diseases in particular kidney diseases, and to perhaps find new treatments. Now, have, have you all heard of these things called stem cells? I mean, you know, 
I think every child now doing GCSEs or A-levels, they get taught about these things called stem cells. But, you know, when I was doing those uh, O and A-levels, I, I don't think stem cells had been invented. But now you read about them in the Sunday uh, magazines and so on. And the idea of a stem cell is that it's a stem cell you can normally find in a really early human embryo, maybe in the first week after the egg is fertilized by a sperm. And any of these one cells have got the potential to become any organ in the body, brain, heart, and, and kidney, anything you want. And over the last 15 years, people have been able to isolate these stem cells and start to study them. Now, when, when this field started, the only way you could get human stem cells was to go to a very early human embryo and to take cells from a very early uh, human embryo and then study those cells in the laboratory. And those embryos came from, in inverted commas, spare fertilized embryos where people were having um, uh, test tube babies made. Uh, you know uh, some, some women have difficulty um, conceiving, so they have to donate their eggs. The eggs are taken out of the body. They're fertilized with sperm, and then a few of the eggs are put back into the woman's womb to have a baby. But in that process, there are many spare eggs, and it's from those that the human stem cells were made. But some people have you know, felt uneasy about that because, you know, they, after all, they did come from very early human embryos. And more recently, what we can do, which I think removes all of the ethical issues, really, is we can make these stem cells just from a simple blood sample, you know, from my own blood or from the blood of any of you, from a few milliliters of blood, we can take your blood cells and turn them back into stem cells. So the promise of stem cell technology is twofold, if we go back to the kidney. One of them would be, you know, can we grow a whole new kidney from a stem cell and use that, to put, it, put that new kidney into a person, and then they wouldn't need to have a conventional kidney transplant or dialysis. The other promise of using the stem cells is, you know, could we take stem cells from someone with a genetic rare disease and could we recreate their kidney disease maybe in a dish to understand the disease better and maybe test new therapies on, on a model of kidney disease in a dish? <clears throat> so I'm just going to go through some of these examples. Now, the nice thing about this work is that, near, you know, all of the work is human-based, <coughs> But there is one slide I'm going to show you that involves a mouse, and we had to use a mouse for one of the tests, but it's not a particularly nasty test on the mouse, but I just mentioned that. So um, if you look to the um, left of the screen in front of you, this is what these stem cells look like when they're growing in a dish, and you look down a microscope, and they actually look rather boring you know, I put it in grey to make them look even more boring. But what you can do is you can add certain factors to these cells. These factors um, tell these stem cells either to form a brain or a heart or a kidney. And here we've added factors to the cells to tell them to start to make a kidney. So after a couple of weeks in a dish, when we add these factors, we get this little structure in the middle it's only about a millimetre across, and if you look inside that structure, it's got some branched tubules in it, and you may say, well, oh, that looks absolutely nothing like a kidney, but actually that looks very much like a human kidney at about seven or eight weeks gestation, when the kidney is less than a millimetre across and it's got just some branched tubules inside it. And the picture on, on the right here is one such human kidney from a terminated fetus, not with a rare disease, but it's got a very similar internal structure. Now, in, in a dish, you, you can get the kidney to form a little bit more than that, but it's, it's not really like, you know, a kidney inside you or me. 
And what we were able to do, and this is where we did have to use mice for an experiment, if we start again on the left, we, we made some of these early kidney cells in a dish from the human stem cells, and then we transplanted these just under the, back, under the skin on the back of a mouse. And we waited a few months. We didn't really know what would happen. Actually, we thought the cells would probably die. But after a few months, we saw a little bump on the back of the mouse. It's not a terrible thing, just a little bump. And then if we look inside that bump, we got a big surprise because we find we had grown actually a, a little kidney about one, one centimeter across. And if you, sorry, if you look, this is a go back. If you look inside um, the kidney down a microscope, you start to see on the right here all kinds of interesting kidney structures. You, you probably know the main structure inside the kidney is something called the glomerulus. It, that's like a sieve. It filters the blood to clean the blood to make urine. And in these, in these mini kidneys, we start to see these glomeruli. And we could also show these glomeruli had started to filter the blood as they do normally and make a little bit of urine. And here is a, uh, another picture of that. And as well as the glomeruli, these mini kidneys have got all the kind of tubular components that our kidneys normally have. So we were quite excited about that. And I could, you know, I could sort of talk this up and make it sound very, very important. So I could, here is a section of one of these mini kidneys grown under the skin of a mouse. I could turn it on its side, or it looks a bit like a kidney shape. And I could put a picture of a normal human kidney on there, and you'd say, oh, they, oh, they look a bit the same. But actually, there are some major problems. One of them is the problem of scale. These mini kidneys are only one centimeter long, and a real human kidney is 12 centimeters long. Oh, you say that's one-tenth of normal, but it's not, because at the volume matters, not just the one dimension. So you would need... 2,000 of these mini kidneys to form one normal kidney. The other problem we have at the moment with the technology is that we can't form the ureter tube yet. We can't form the ureter tube that normally drains urine from the kidney. The other thing that we can't form, and no one else can, has worked out how to form it as well, are to make the big blood vessels that will feed the kidney. And uh, these mini kidneys that we can grow in a dish or after implanting it into a mouse, they're fed with little capillaries, little blood vessels, but not the great big renal artery you need. And without, without a big renal artery, you're never going to make very much urine. And without a ureter, you're never going to drain the ur urine to, to get it out of the body. So, you know, this is the state of the art in growing mini kidneys maybe in five or ten years' time will have solved these technical problems and these can be used instead of conventional kidney transplants. But for the last five minutes, I'll show you the other side of the story that I think is even more relevant to what you're interested in, which is to use stem cells to model rare diseases, in particular rare kidney disease. Now, I'm a children's kidney doctor and nearly all the children that we see, the young children who end up needing dialysis or a transplant, they were born without any kidneys or with abnormally <coughs> formed kidneys. And it, when I was a medical student, no one knew, well, we never taught what causes this. But we now know that many of these babies have got a genetic cause for their, their abnormal kidneys. And we know that what these genes are normally doing is that they're telling the kidney to, to form and grow normally before birth. So in our, in our renal genetic clinics in the children's hospital, we see quite a lot of families now with inherited kidney disease where the babies are born with abnormal kidneys and they have a genetic cause. So we thought, look, why don't we try and use stem cell technology to recreate these abnormal, gene genetically abnormal kidneys in a dish, 
if we could do that, then maybe we could test different drugs and make those kidneys grow more normally. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with these family trees, but you've probably seen them before. But each, each level here is a different generation, and the filled-in circles and squares are the, the women and the males in the family who have got the kidney disease. And this is one example of a family that I saw in, actually in Great Ormond Street, where you can see the kidney malformations being transmitted from one generation to the next. In fact, the granddad, he, he had two wives, not at the same time, and he started two generations of kidney malformations. And um, this is what these kidney malformations look like on the uh, right. Unfortunately, this was a very severe one, and the baby didn't survive long after birth. This is an autopsy sample with a very malformed kidney with fluid-filled cysts in it, but no normal tissue. So, you know, this is, this is what we were thinking about a few years ago. So we thought, let's go to the families with rare kidney disease and ask them what they think about this idea. Now, the commonest gene that we see going wrong in, in this population, it doesn't really matter what it's called, but it's called HNF1B, hepatocyte nuclear factor 1 beta, if you will. And um, there is a, a group, a family group, that have been established in the UK for about the last eight years. They meet every year or so to get together to, to learn about research, what's going on in this disease, and to swap stories. So they happened to be meeting in Manchester um, in 2016. And you know, I went to talk to them and I put it to them, how would you feel if we took blood samples from you and your kids and made stem cells from the blood samples and then tried to grow mini kidneys to understand your disease? And actually, I wasn't, wasn't really sure what they would say because it sounds a bit Frankenstein, but they were really interested. So we got all the ethics done and then started to do this. So this was a kidney scan of the first um, guy with this disease who donated his blood. He was actually now a young adult. He, he was on dialysis. Here are his two very abnormal kidneys. He gave us a blood sample shown on the upper uh, right. And then I run with that blood sample through, through the hospital complex to the university and the stem cell biologist made stem cells. And then the question was, would his stem cells make a kidney in a dish and would they look different from normal? And in this family, we were very lucky because his mother said, I want to be in involved in the research. The mother didn't have the same disease, so she, made, she gave us blood to make stem cells. And this is, the, I think, one of the last slides I wanted to show you, but it's a striking slide. So we, starting with the mother's stem cells, we, we pushed them into forming a kidney in a dish. And her cells, greatly magnified, form this, you know, this mass of tissue, which has got lots of little tubules in it and lots of little glomeruli. Now, what, what does her son's stem cells do? Well, her son's stem cells do form you know, a mass of tissue, but I think you can see immediately they look quite different to his mother's. He's, although it's, he forms a mass of tissue, there are, there are fewer internal structures. And if you look down the microscope, you can see this in more detail. His mother's um, uh, stem cells form these nice glomeruli that are the filtering units of the kidney. And on the right, the son hardly has any of these filtering units in his um, kidney tissue, but instead he has these very big malformed tubules. So what we're doing now, this is my, my last slide, is you know, you saying, well, that's interesting, but you know, what's the point? But the, the point is, we can now have an abnormal kidney in a dish, it's a genetically abnormal kidney, and we can start to ask, why is that different to his mother's normal kidney? And in this picture here, I won't go through it in, in detail at all, 
but we can look at the, the activity of every gene in the human genome, tens of thousands of genes, and find out what is overactive in the son's abnormal kidney, what's underactive versus his mother. So everything on the right-hand side is an overactive gene. Everything to the, right, uh, the other side in blue is an underactive gene. And many of these genes code for um, proteins that are what we call druggable targets. They are, they are proteins where we, that we can manipulate and intervene. So the idea would be that by understanding this a bit more, could we find druggable targets, and if we added a particular drug to the abnormal kidney, would it push it to a more normal way? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish there. This disease actually, many, it, it's got implications beyond the kidney because many of these individuals, when they, when they become adults, they also get sugar diabetes. And it's because this gene not only causes the kidney to grow before birth, but it causes our pancreas to grow before birth. Um, so this is a, you know, interesting disease. Now, this is only one rare kidney disease. There are, you know, hundreds of these, and this technology can be applied to, to, to any of those others. I'm going to finish there because I've gone on probably too long anyway. You know, I'm just really a kidney doctor who's kind of interested in, in kidney research, but to do this work, you, you have to have a whole, you know, you've got the patient groups, you've got the basic researchers, we've got a stem cell laboratory, we've got a fantastic human um, genetic unit in Manchester, and, and all these people have to get together. And then, you know, the, the, the boring stuff, as you know, most of the time researchers are writing grants, uh, we are funded we can, by whoever will give us money, including the EU, unfortunately we probably won't be able to apply to them anymore, um, but MRC, you know, Wellcome Trust, everyone else has helped us in the work. And here's a mosaic of a kidney from Ravenna in Italy. Thanks.